Andy, our, our final panelist, came down with COVID, and so he will not be able to join us. He wanted to, uh, but I, I said that he should probably just rest and recover. Um, so in the past, we were using, for the past three events, which I know a bunch of you were here for, we were using a tool called Mentimeter to engage you, and that was a place we were going to be asking questions. Uh, I want to try not using that this time uh, because it made my face really small on the screen, and I really want to make sure that all of you get to stare at it. Um, so instead, the way... <laughs> Oh no, Joe. Joe very much <laughs> with me. That's unfortunate. Um, so the way the way this is going to work this time is uh, all the questions that you have, uh, please message Tara. So Tara is pinned on the screen. She will be the question moderator. Um, so please do not put any questions in the chat. That will be annoying and hard for us to read. Tara will be the arbiter of good questions, um, and so she will be fielding all of your questions. Um, so the way this is going to work, our panelists are going to introduce themselves. Um, and in a bit longer and more uh, circuitous of a way than ordinarily, the way I would like you folks to introduce yourselves is by really outlining your career path and highlighting some really key choices or pivotal moments that you found along the way. Um, and then we're going to jump into the discussion. We're going to be talking about a bunch of cool things like lab automation and shifting team structures and inter interdisciplinary teams, all these great things. Um, and so let's let's get to it. Joe, why don't you why don't you lead us off? Sure, why not? Um, how, how long are you looking for here? Because uh, I can ramble infinitely, but I want to keep I'll, it. I'll, I'll tell you to shut up if you're getting real, real rambly. Okay. Um, I think some of the most important things for me in my personal journey have been in being really clear, like think, have, think about it from a top down perspective, like being really clear on meaning, because for me, meaning drives motivation um, and that creates passion and that creates getting up and going um, every morning and working for 16 hours a day, uh, which is what actually makes things work. So um, it's been a bit of a circuitous route for me. Uh, one thing that I did really early on uh, as like in my teens, I made this weird pact with myself and decided that I'm just not gonna work on anything that doesn't matter, that doesn't, that I'm not, actually, it wasn't so much focused on impact as it was just on like, it has to be interesting. Like I want to work on interesting stuff, um, and 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 I like I grew up really poor on like welfare and um, and I like even if that means I have to be poor and again and live in a tent under an overpass, um, I'm cool with that because I know how to do that and it's not that bad. Um, but that that's the deal that I'm making. And so I, and, and like, and so, so like always choose interesting over money and somehow it just always turns into money for me. So like, I never had to worry about it. Um, I don't know if that's just a privileged, uh, like, like algorithm that I got to choose. Um, but, um, but just based on survivor bias, I highly recommend it. Um, so my own caveats. So, uh, I think that I grew up in the, um, Pacific Northwest rainforests, um, and just, yeah. Really, oh, huh? Everyone, mute you yourselves. Thank you. Or you can you have the power of muting too, probably. Um, cool. Uh, well, I, I think for a long time, for a long time, I thought probably preserving Earth's natural biodiversity was the most important thing. Um, and so. I could just put a bunch of energy into understanding, working on that, researching it. Um, I did a degree at Har Harvard in environmental geoscience. I went off to MIT as a grad student, studied ocean, you know, climate basically, um, like chem chemistry of ocean circulation, stuff like that. Um, and then at some point, it's just as I was like, I was trying, it's like I have to extrapolate out, like, what is my hugest goal? I, I want to go achieve that. And like every time I would try to extrapolate out environmental stuff. The, the perfect version of that always ended up with exterminate all humans. That is perfect environmentalism. And it's a, finally, it's like this, the, the, this, that controversial, that, uh, that, that, that like, like conf, there was this, like this conflict at the, at the core of that. Um, it was like, Hey, it didn't include me unless I want to be an asshole and be the only human. Um, but, but like B is just like, wait a minute, all, everything good about the world, everything I enjoy, and like what I would want to do in a perfect environment is hang out, hang out with humans. Like humans, humans are everything. Um, and that was just like a sudden. That was like a big switch to me. Um, and, so, and but I think 
clarifying that, like, okay, what I'm going to devote my life to is making the world good for humans, um, was very different. Um, and it's like, it was also very clear, like, I'm just lucky to be freed of that, like, what I'm going to devote my life to is making as much money as I can for myself. Um, like, I just don't care about money that much. Like, I have plenty, um, ironically. Um, um, but, you know, so there's like, well, you can work on a particular cause, you can, you can work for yourself, um, or you can work um, to make life better for people. So I think after, um, so like, then the, the question is longevity, like after my, after the, like the like financial liquidity event for my first company, I was like, okay, I should just retire now. And I thought that, well, I tried it for like 10 days and it was just incredibly boring. Um, and then, and then I thought, okay, I want to, I want to, I want to, I got to do stuff. Um, it's never enough. I have like one really emotionally supportive parent and one like really kind of psycho parent, um, which ends up with uh, producing a personality that is like reasonably like secure enough to be like stable and do like decade long projects um, and not like, like flip out and fall apart. Um, but like just having this like gnawing hole at the center of my soul, like nothing's ever enough and I'm never going to please that psycho parent, uh, which creates like this kind of useful, but um, unpleasant drive. Um, so anyway, I, I um, at that point I was like, okay, what, what is the, what is the most important thing for humans? And then I could, I just could survey like the, 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 like, like you can do it negatively. Like, what do they need? Like, what are they missing? Um, what, 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 what's bad about being human? Because intrinsically, it just seems like if everything else is fine, then it's awesome. We're happy. Um, we love to hang out and do stuff. Um, so it was like war, famine, poverty, um, and like disease. Um, and like war, famine, and poverty are all political things. And I'm crap at politics and I love technology. So like disease seems like the technology thing. Um, and so what is disease? And then just you just go look at like hospital budgets and health healthcare spend um, and like all of those, all everything about health boils down to like 85% age related disease and a little bit of other stuff. So like, okay, everybody should be working on age related disease. Um, what causes it? Um, the stuff that's really poorly studied, um, and mostly people are addressing age-related disease by thinking about it from what I call disease biology instead of through aging biology, um, which seems logical, I guess, if you want to make a therapeutic in a hurry, but short-sighted um, if you want to kind of follow this thesis that there are a smaller number of aging mechanisms than age-related diseases, um, then you should deal with the aging mechanisms and then like lots of downstream diseases will be prevented and ameliorated. So um it's like that I came to that conclusion and then I just I've just been like 100 percent aging pretty much from then on out. Um I think a big shift for me was like how do I convert myself over from being mostly a tech nerd um to doing bio. Um and I did it gradually like the next startup I did after that was like a like a tech-enabled drug discovery services for pharma. This company called Viome, which made like the matrix for mice basically. And um, so that was a way that I could apply sort of tech sensibilities like building electronics and software um, in support of doing drug discovery um, without having to be just pure, pure bio. Um, was that meant to be a bridge for you? Like was there- what? Was that meant I mean, to be I think effectively it was a bridge for me. Um, like I had this initial bio, like when I first got to Harvard and then I also took a detour over to Caltech, I did biophysics for a while. Um, and I got some kind of bio there. And before I also took a break between high school and college of six years just to teach myself stuff. Um, and I read a bunch of bio then too, because just interesting little machines. Um, but like the actual nitty gritty hardcore like it's a it's a it's different from like just reading nature um to actually executing in experimental biology um it's like reading about sports versus becoming a football player or something you know it's like super different um uh, so i think that 
I think it, I think it, I think it was really inefficient, um, but it was effective for me just to be exposed to the process of drug discovery for eight years um, through through customers mostly, but also implementing experiments on our side in in the vivarium, which is different from you know at the pipe head. Um, but I, I ended up just like with my brain kind of permeated by bio. And also another thing I did like fairly early on was start. That's a weird way to learn, but just started investing in bio too. Um, and got some pretty, got a, like at least one like pretty lucky early hit. Um, and then that also just kind of got me in there talking with people doing biology and thinking about it and like what works, what doesn't. Um, um, so, um, you still haven't stopped me, which is weird. I, mean, um, I, was, I, I was about actually about to, because it definitely has been way too long and rambly, but also very raw and interesting and kind of beautiful. Okay. So I was like, let me yeah. just let this go. Okay. And hopefully Luca and Sam do not go quite as long. But yeah, so, so um, let's accelerate a bit, maybe closer to retro when you decided you wanted to start a more direct longevity company. Yeah. Um, at, at, after Viam, I was just like, I want to do the actual thing, not just the thing that supports the thing. Um, like what I call a type one play instead of a type two play. Um, and like, what better way than to just jump in and do it as a as CEO? So that's that's what I said. I think part, part of what happened is that when I like looked again, okay, what's the next thing to do? Last time there, there didn't seem to be that much ready for translation, maybe senescent cells or something. Um, um, but man, this time there's just so much, like aging biology came a really, really long way. And the bio tools also came a long way. Like single cell, I think is like probably one of the biggest things to happen to all of biology in a really, really long time. And that happened in the meantime. And um, so then, yeah, I, I should just do, I just do the thing. Um, and right now I am doing it as sort of a, like a combo CEO plus CSO, um, which is, sort of insane um but i think it's like a it's possible because i have like five like group leads like program leads who i trust who are really good um so they're actually kind of like mini cso's um but i stay super involved in the experiments like i pretty much read the like experimental data every week from every single program right now but it's possible because we're only 45 people um and what do you guys uh, work on? What are we what? Working on. Tell us a bit. Oh, yeah. About um, so like our, I guess our three main bets right now, like my criterion is like there's so much interesting biology out there. You could spend your life just like immersed in basic science and just understanding it for fun. Um, but it's really distracting and I get a lot of FOMO. Um, so I had to put uh, like erect like a safety barrier for myself to keep the um, like my intellectual curiosity from just wasting all my time. Um, so like we work on things that already have good animal proof of concept. Um, that's like the table stakes for getting in the door. Um, and the three best things I could find for that beginning of, of retro were heterochronic parabiosis um, as, a, like a, as a general intervention that had a lot of rejuvenated phenotypes gonna be excited um and um a particular particular area of autophagy that uh has like a whole string of potential indications leading up to include up to and including some neurodegenerative things um and then like probably the biggest bet is on partial reprogramming um which i know is quite fashionable um uh so that's, that's what we're doing awesome thank you all right luca you're next well, hey everybody, Luke and F, CEO and co-founder of Vanti. Um, yeah, maybe give a little bit of background about Vanti first, since you know, uh, especially in the longevity community, we might not be as well known. So Vanti is an AI first biotech um, that focuses on induced proximity. And induced proximity is a novel modality of small molecule drugs that basically allow you to bring two proteins together in the cell. The uh, informal introduction that I usually say is we provide dating services for proteins. Um, and, uh, you know, actually, you know, one molecule, which many people on this call might know, rapamycin, turns out is a proxemia inducer. It's a molecular glue that basically brings together the kinase mTOR together with FKBB12, which is this polyl isomerase, and shuts down mTOR in that activity extremely selectively. 
And our vision is sort of to convert the proteome into a modeler toolkit where we can just hijack any of the naturally occurring enzymes in the cell and use them to do really exciting disease biology. For example, you know, in terms of the clinic, you know, the most, uh, uh, I guess, well trotted path is targeted protein degradation, where we do a lot of work where you uh, hijack naturally occurring enzymes called E3 ligases to degrade um, disease causing proteins, for example, proteins associated with um, with uh, with cancer or neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, yeah, so we're AI first, which means that, you know, part of our company is a big AI research group, which in our case is led by Michael, Michael Bronstein. He's one of the pioneers of geometric deep learning. And basically what we do is we use generative AI to predict uh, specifically 3D conformations and the uh, structures of the molecules. And um, so we have quite a big of, you know, fundamental uh, AI research group that is going on, but we also have a big uh, data generation platform, which sort of feeds uh, back into loop. So that's a uh, proteomics based platform, which uh, we've developed. Um, yeah, we've been uh, quite luckily so far uh, commercially. So we work with some of the largest biotechs and pharma companies that trust us to work uh, on these um, on these programs. So we work with Johnson & Johnson, Beringheim, Blueprint Medicines. Uh, we're a Royvent spin out. So Royvent is a multinational pharma company, which already has approved drugs that sort of starts these focused vents um, around specific areas. And so we're spun out of Royvent. And, and, and so we work with a lot of the Royvent companies as well. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what we do. And uh, I guess me personally, and, and one of the reasons why I'm very excited to speak uh, as part of the series is because, you know, I, I switched fields so many times, I probably can't count. So uh, always been excited by many different things. I don't really come from an academic family. I'm the only one in my family who studied. And to be honest, you know, the only reason why I, I got into science is because it was a the school was basically free in Europe and it was the nearest school and my all my friends went there and then you know coming there you basically realized oh crap this is actually amazing uh, and science is really really cool I uh, started off in molecular bio and uh, realized very very quickly that I'm horrible at pipetting and then I sort of tried to do a sharp turn into more of the engineering side of things and, and to get a little bit of the math back and then eventually transitioned into more to computer science and focused on uh, on deep learning for uh, the rest of my studies, you know, I did research in, in, in Stanford in chemical engineering and in, in Tokyo and, and, and Japan and worked with a couple of regenerative medicine biotechs there as well. And then, um, you know, instead of being, uh, doing a PhD, I actually, um, I think, took an interesting other route, which is I wanted to really understand how does drug discovery work on a large scale, and especially how can you impact it with tools like machine learning. And so instead of doing a PhD, I was like, okay, what is the fastest way for me to get exposure to uh, how you can, you know, drive value with these novel technologies in a large drug discovery context? And so I actually went to McKinsey, and what I did there is I worked with uh, at McKinsey's machine learning group, Quantum Black, and we basically did a lot of sort of uh, early drug discovery and tried to integrate and, and improve the processes of like big pharmas by applying AI. And that turned out to be a really, really good idea because it really, you know, gave me a lot of insights on, you know, where the problems lacking and where can you make progress quickly and then eventually start Advantii together uh, uh, with Zach, who's also uh, uh, at, that, at uh, McKinsey at that time, roughly four years ago. And so, yeah, we're roughly 40 people now and all over uh, the globe. So we have people in Switzerland, we have people in the UK, we have people in the United States. Awesome. Yeah, I, I also like that both of you got to experience some pharma stuff and then bring that into innovative biotech instead of kind of jumping straight into that. that that's something that, that a lot of folks, they get excited by stuff that's happening on the edge, but they don't have any exposure to, you know, where most of the work actually ends up happening. And that that's super valuable. So our, our, our third panelist is wildly different breed than <laughs> previous two. Um, and I brought him because I think Sam will, will be able to lend a really, really awesome perspective and help, help us drill into some really practical things. So I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Cool. Yeah, I'm definitely definitely the outsider here. Uh, nice to meet everyone. My name is Sam Sperlin. Uh, I am partner and uh, first employee at a company called The Ready. Uh, and what The Ready is, is a, a future of work consultancy uh, where we help organizations um, kind of to use our metaphor, upgrade their organizational operating system out of the industrial era. 
So basically, uh, many, I would say most of uh, our, some of our largest organizations are running on assumptions and principles and practices uh, that really came out of um, the industrial era and have just kind of been somewhat adapted to our current moment. And we, we try to help organizations go from this incredibly um, hierarchical, top-down, um, kind of uh, command and control way of working into more of a uh, network, uh, complex adaptive system sort of approach to thinking about how do our organizations actually work and what does it require from leadership and from employees and from everyone involved in organizations to actually function in this more self-managing, um, potentially um, more ambiguous kind of way of, of working. So we work with um, ranging from, from startups to Fortune 100 organizations to um, really kind of get into the weeds and figure out more adaptive ways of working that actually allow organizations to go off and achieve these amazing uh, purposes uh, that we are, you know, that we're very familiar with in this space. And as far as my background, really quick, because it is so different from everybody else's, uh, you know, I, I started my career as a, as a high school uh, teacher, uh, economics, government, uh, history, and very quickly, um, I didn't have the words for it at the time, but realized that the organization that is the American public school system, that bureaucracy uh, was never going to let me actually have the impact that I wanted to have. That org, the organization design of uh, the, the, the public school system was, um, is, is and remains kind of irreparably broken. And I decided to go to grad school to study organizational psychology. While there became aware of um, a bunch of interesting developments um, in organizational theory, thinking about organizations as, um, as I said before, as adaptive systems. So things like sociocracy and holacracy, these more self-managing ways of working being experimented with in very large and impactful organizations. So got connected there, started my PhD on that, and then um, became aware of the Ready and started work at the Ready um, as the first employee. Ended up dropping out of my PhD program to help build uh, the Ready, and we're up to about 45 people or so right now spread across the world um, doing this organizational design consulting. So the, re the reason why I wanted to, to bring Sam's perspective here is because, um, and this is perhaps something that our, our panels can disagree with, but, but from what I've seen, technical skills are rarely uh, the bottleneck for, for teams and, and for people. A lot of times it's people's ability to, and desire to work with other people and, and as well as the structures that they're a part of. Because if you're, let's say, part of a company, uh, let's say you work in machine learning, you're part of a company whose, whose practices around data are atrocious, you're not capable of actually doing good work. And so your ability to navigate these environments and understand these shifting landscapes will be a really important predictor or lever even of your success. It's not just about, let me get really great at machine learning. Let me get really great at programming. Let me get really good at handling a pipette. A lot of this is just understanding the context that you're in and what's required to change it or how you should be thinking about navigating it. And so that's going to be a whole part of this discussion is we're not just going to be talking about what are new things that are coming around the bend with, with software and machine learning and lab automation. It's also what, how is this going to manifest in real world environments and, and how can you think about these things in a way that will equip you to work with more agency? Um, because that's really critical for doing good work. You will often will not be put in a position by your leaders to do really great work. And often it will take some initiative and some agency to ensure that you are able to do that. And so- yeah, And I, in a perfect world, I would just say, you know, our organization should be, um, should be amplifiers of all of the, the people working within the organization and too often, uh, being in an organization actually kind of diminishes your impact because of all the organizational debt that you are saddled with when you become a, a member of an organization that is using kind of this industrial era OS. That's what we're trying to get rid of so that organizations truly are a human superpower and can amplify the impact that we can have on the world. Absolutely. And it's, and it's very easy for us to get caught up in the tech. Um, and we're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk a bit more. So the software machine learning, the first thing that I really want to talk about with respect to this um, are the limitations. So there's a lot of hype. There's a lot of nonsense that's going around. Um, there, are, there are also a lot of really exciting advancements being led, like NVIDIA partnered with Recursion Pharma, and they're doing some really incredible out there stuff. And a lot of people are going to try and copy what they're doing. And you will probably be urged to, to imitate or emulate some of these kinds of practices. But the reality is that there's a lot to be skeptical of, not necessarily about the technology, but about the reality and the pace with which, with, with which it's going to develop. 
So I would love Joe, Luca, um, Sam, if you have an opinion about this, but I'm, I'm guessing not as much. Uh, jump in and let's talk about it and feel free to interrupt each other and say interesting things. So, so yeah, let's start. What are, what are some of the clear limitations of, of machine learning and, and all this AI that is perfusing our organizations now? Hmm. Uh, um, um, well, I think one, one of the, um, when I was going, going about deciding how I wanted to st structure retro, um, and also I could talk all day on organizational design, but, um, the, the, like, okay, I haven't run a, like a, like a discovery phase, like hardcore biotech research company before. What should I do? What's going to be hard about it? And one of the things people said is that you're going to have, um, with these modern tools, like so much data, like what, what, what I see happening all over the place is that somebody does like a three week experiment, um, and they, they run a, you know, a hundred thousand cells through a 10 X. Um, and then they spent the next six months trying to figure out what the heck it all means. Um, and they're like poking around at various different like R packages and, and looking at UMAPs and scratching their heads and like, um, get really good computational biologists and have a really high ratio of them to, to experimentalists. So that's like a thesis that I've been pushing on. I mean, I'm not like out on the in situ end of the spectrum, but, um, I do have like eight comp bio folks out of like maybe 20, 21 total PhDs. Um, I've heard of ratios of 200 to one. So that's, that's pretty damn good. Yeah. So like in my mind, I keep thinking in the back of my head, I am not crazy if I have one-to-one. -one. Um, always keep the door open for incredibly brilliant people who can do computational biology. And, and like each time I hire another one um, or Alex Trapp hires another one, um, they're immediately busy. Like there's so much work to do in making meaning out of, um, uh, out of all this data that we're getting. Cause we have like flow cytometry data, uh, which is massively underutilized in my opinion, in most companies um, and poorly, poorly analyzed. Um, and then like at least four different modalities of, of like omics kind of data. And in and, and the sense of like RNA expression, a couple of different ways. Um, there's like fixed three prime, five prime. Um, there's VDJ a taxi. What's the limitation here? Is it just that this is so much harder and more complex than most organizations are are really acknowledging, and therefore, um, you know, you can't really do a good job of this work if if you don't have the right ratios or you just have few, too few computationalists? What's the like? One of the things about like like wet lab experimentalists are just like weirdly technophobic. Um, it's like I, I didn't actually expect that phenomenon as much. Uh, cause I just, I personally just love machines and engineering and designing and, and like systems and, um, um, but like if an instrument breaks, it's like, uh, call the, call the rep. Um, I'm like, I don't know, you check to see if like the hose came unplugged or something. It's like, ah, it's not working. Um, and similarly around computational stuff, um, like. I think you can make much nicer charts if you just spun up a Jupyter, Jupyter notebook and use Seaborn or whatever um, for a particular thing. And they're like, ah, here's some graph pad. It's a little bit more my speed. You know, they'd rather like click around um, on, a, on a GUI. Um, and so I think what happens is that experimentalists will make a data set. And if if they're just like, if it's it's their PhD or something and they're kind of all all alone on their own, they have to kind of kind of stab away at the data set, but it's really hard to like I think the, the trouble is it's really hard to figure out what they mean. You have a, like a terabyte of fast queues. What do you do? You know, you run it through like there's the there's the standard sort of vanilla you've probably seen, you know, five years ago, it was like the the way to publish yet another paper um in a decent journal was take something that somebody's already done. Um run a bunch of cells from it through 10x, make a pretty UMAP, um, and then and publish it and, and make some sort of hand wavy arguments around like this cluster seems to be the less differentiated cells and these are the more differentiated cells. I'm like, that's yeah. all you needed to do. Yeah. I can't understand that, Alexander. Um, but 
Uh, but there's so much meaning. Like, so what, what I find the workflow actually ends up being like is that we have this huge data set. Um, somebody brilliant and experienced in ex ex extracting meaning from a big multidimensional, high dimensional data set, um, say Alex, um, takes a pass at it. Um, right now I require this formalism where the experimentalists have to pose questions that they want to interrogate from the data set um, in order to create more structure um, and velocity. Like, so while the sequencing is happening, they have to su have submitted questions and then the, the computational people can think about it. Um, um, they're also highly embedded the in computational that. people involved earlier. Like, are they getting involved to kind of help the experimentalists kind of think through the questions that should be asked? For sure. Um, yeah, I think an, another bug that people have mentioned in, in orgs is that you have like an experimental group or you have like an experimental, I mean, sorry, you have a computational group or computational core um, or just like distant collaborator computational people. Um, and like you make the data set eventually and you throw it over the wall and then you sit like, analyze this for me. Um, and then you wait around and finally they send you uh, like a bunch of charts and graphs and like, okay, here's, here's the analysis. Um, but it, that is really broken because for one thing, you need them there at the very beginning when you're designing the experiment to make sure that you structure this, the, um, like the samples and batches um, this, uh, with correctly with respect to the experimental variables you're looking at because batch effects are so strong, um, both in like the sort of like droplet and like single cell methods um, and also in the sequencing um, that if you don't distribute your experimental variables properly across the various things that will form batch effects, then you can end up confounded and you can't tell which is biological signal um, and which is like technical artifact. Um, so you want them there at the very beginning and they can also give you an idea of like what's gonna be significant, how many cells you need. Um, and then um, and then later, uh, they really have, they have to have, have a continuous conversation. So this is this thing about computational biology and I hope a lot of you get involved in it because I think biology will just continue to become more and more computational, but you have to understand biology. Like you can't like, and it's a really deep, thick stack of knowledge. So like, so there's this one guy, so like, I'll just describe briefly and just cut me off any time because I'm not attached to any any of these these directions. Um, only the, just to present them in case they're useful. But this, this one guy, Jared, um, just really wanted to get into computational biology. And um, he's, he's an MD before, and he, but he's just like really freaking smart and super motivated. Um, and um, there's a machine learning engineer as well, which helped. <laughs> yeah, some of that for sure. Um, but I was just like, no, you don't know enough. Um, and he's like, I'll work for free. Um, um, so like, okay, I can't let you do that. Um, like it feels wrong, but I'll let you work for like minimum wage. Um, and so he just slaved his ass off for a long period of time, like learning and learning and learning and learning our biology. Um, and then like, okay, now you can be like a more formal contractor for a while. And he kept going for a really long time and he just got better, better, but it's, it's hard. Like he had to work like 16 hours a day from, for many months just to kind of start to understand the biology. Um, and I don't, you don't need to go off and get a PhD and you don't need to like take formal classes or anything, but you need to like really like immerse yourself. Like you have to want to learn biology to do computational biology. I think there's, not, there's, there's some kind of like perception that this computational research is not that hard. And there's a lot of confidence that people have in all these computational models and, and I know since I started working in bio, I've just become skeptical of every single thing that I read. And like, you'll see lots of things about climate. And I'm like, sure, I believe that the climate's changing, but this is all based on these models. And these models are probably all bullshit because our capacity to use these models is, is, is really kind of low. Um, and, and, and when it comes to bio, I mean, the way that we gather data is, is really problematic across a whole bunch of different things. Like, like Joe mentioned batch effects, which is a big problem, but one of them is that the way that we sample tissues um, can corrupt the, the data that we get. And there are so many things that can go wrong that, that I really wonder when it comes to, like, I believe that computational biology and these computational technologies are essential and there's so much potential there. But I also wonder if we're really capable of using these things in a, in a useful way, even if it's not going to be perfect or, or 
percent correct. Are we really capable of using these tools right now? I mean, I would answer unequivocally yes, but the caveats are huge. And if you just, I mean, I think the the default assumption, I think especially for people coming out of uh, a more, I want, like, I want I want Luca to, to get involved as well. Yeah, um, yeah sorry, <laughs> not at all. Like I said, this this is friendly. We're going to interrupt each other. We're going to cut each other Great. off. Tell Great. someone to Great. shut up. That's how it works. Yeah. So you're you're talking about limitations and like busy. Many of the points you hit, Joe. Uh, you know, uh, uh, reminisce me of a lot of uh, traumatic uh, experience at, at McKinsey applying these sort of um, or trying to get organizations to adopt these technologies at a large scale. And uh, I think there's there's a, a boatload of limitations. So number one, which is I think we we're just talking about, is applying it to the wrong problem. So. Um, that very often happens if you have people that, for example, don't know uh, biology or don't understand chemistry, try to apply them, right? They'll just uh, try to black box everything and just go in as like, oh, I have this fancy new hammer, you know, I'm just going to make everything a nail now. And I think that is one of the key issues. And, and um, you know, a lot of even our researchers, they have very strong fundamentals in chemistry and biology because if you don't do that, you just end up tricking yourself. These models are in incredibly complex. And you can make them to tell you whatever you want. You can fit a UMAP to separate any two cell types you want. Um, and if you don't have like a good intuition behind what you're doing, it, it's a very, very bad idea. So uh, that's one of the key limitations. So number one is applying it where it doesn't work. And for me, like the mental model is if I can't come up with a benchmark that convinces me that if a method can solve this, it has truly understood the underlying dynamics, for example, chemistry or biology, then I'm not gonna trust it. And I don't think you, for example, most of the academic benchmarks and most of the methodologies that you see you know, put out in the field, they're not benchmarked in that way at all. And so uh, applying it to the wrong um, sort of subject, uh, and that often happens from people that you know, don't take the time to study biology or the chemistry, I think is, is one of the key things that is going wrong. So Sam, I'm I'm curious, what what have you seen in, in organizations? Because because let's say let's say some of our folks here are working in pharma for some large companies, um, and they're you know some CEO found out that AI is a thing, and they're like, okay, we need to throw this everywhere. Uh, but they probably don't have the the relevant uh, sophistication or maturity with with respect to these kinds of technologies. So I'm curious if you've encountered these kinds of situations in the organizations you've worked with, where there's some kind of top-down directive, hey, we're gonna start doing the thing, but the conditions really aren't right yet for, for individuals to actually be able to do that correctly. And so I guess my question is, what do individuals do? What can individuals do in these systems um, to actually kind of start moving the needle in the right direction, um, apart from quitting um, and writing an open letter? But what can they actually do to work within the system to kind of help make sure that we're we're doing things the right way and not just doing things in a buzzwordy, hype-driven, nonsense way? Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a great question. Where my mind goes is um, everything we try to do with it within organizations is taking this really experimental mindset, not in probably in the terms not experiments, not in the way that you all are talking about them, but experiments in terms of how we are doing our own ways of working. And what I'm thinking about in with with your in relates to your question there is how do you take a new technology, a new process and actually experiment on something that truly matters to the organization. So not just going to we're going to take AI and kind of peanut butter spread it across everything so we can say we did it, we can check that off our OKRs and move on with our lives. But how do we actually create a small mission where the whole explicit purpose in a kind of safe to try way is to actually use this new technology on something that matters to the to the organization and, and actually doing it in a constrained way that tells us something um, interesting that we can then use to expand further. Because if you're just going to, as I said before, kind of spread it across everywhere all at once, I don't know how much uh, learning you're actually generating at that point. You're just doing a thing for the sake of, of doing a thing, which makes up a large percentage of a lot of the action in large organizations. Yeah, like 80%. So from a leadership perspective, the idea is start it in a team, two teams, see what works, see what gets adoption. But as an individual who's working on these teams, it's very frustrating if you're if you're a computational biologist and you're trying to do your, your job, but the, the leaders of your company don't really understand, because that's often what this problem is. The leaders just don't really understand these technologies well enough to drive the kind of change that's actually needed. So how can you as an individual maybe start to take some steps towards shifting the culture so that work, good work can actually be done? 
just just, just I mean, don't work for them. Yeah. Just sw switch to a different company where the culture is good. It takes a really long time to change the culture at a company. Meanwhile, you want to get shit done and advance your career. Screw them. Like let them figure out culture on their own over the next few years and join some really exciting company that's, that, that's thought about culture from the very beginning. Sorry. <laughs> Joe has just given the much more direct answer that I was probably going to give the consultant uh, answer <laughs> to. My point was just going to be that it takes a long time to change organizations, and which is why when we work with organizations, if we're not, if we're not coming in at the top, there's a ceiling that happens in any project that we are doing if the leaders don't have a buy-in moment. So I, I've, I have maybe earlier in my career had a more idealistic answer about like, oh, you can like show them the way or whatever. But like, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit more in Joe's <laughs> camp. So then how do you tell? How do you tell this organization is not gonna let me do good work? What are some of the, the signs that you look for that will tell you, okay, it's time for me to get the fuck out and find a different place? Instead of like, cause some organizations, they do something's wrong, but they're actually moving in the right direction. And then some, it's just like, nah, it's not good. It is a, bi a bi-directional process. So like, you know, they're, they're checking out you on uh, making sure that, you know, you're, you're smart and motivated and educated and all that kind of stuff. But like, may, do people seem like they love working there? Um, like, what, how, how does, it, how does the work, does, does the, do like, does leadership seem engaged? Um, do people have uh, like a, a, a nice mix of, of like autonomy, um, mastery, sense of purpose feeling like their work matters like you can ask people really direct questions about what their personal emotional experience is like at the company almost always yeah. people answer them honestly yeah I mean, and, and because yeah. organizations are so fractal sometimes you can be somewhat protected from that if your immediate team or kind of the team of teams that you are interacting with does have that i'm not saying that a, an organization has to be like universally um, exactly like what you want to be doing in order to do good work within a imperfect organization. But eventually, um, you know, you can get to a point where there's just not much more you can do. I mean, the thing that I'm looking for, what I would be looking for if I was in um, that situation is, is it lip service that is being paid to learning or is there actual learning happening up and down and across the, the organization? So is learning a buzzword that is used only from leadership to the rest of us about like how we are supposed to be doing things and learning from our mistakes or is leadership uh, actually demonstrating that they are learning and curious uh, as well? Culture can't be aspirational. It has to be descriptive. So like- It's read only. Yeah, when I defined culture for retro like the the most important directive was make sure it's authentic to me because if people see the ceo doing something different they're going to know that it's bullshit and they're just going to do like what he does or she does and um so we have these culture tenants that are like for instance like more pirate than navy like okay that like that that's me um like they have to all fit. Like they have not, to all fit. I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to create like copies of myself. It's not like an ego thing, but it's just like authenticity. If I'm creating this structure and it fits me, then all my 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 like program leads are going to be like, yeah, this is how we this is how we operate. And and so like you pick the like I don't pick my dysfunctional characteristics. I pick what I think are the most functional ones, um, and then want to amplify those onto the company. And but you know, so if if there's some portion of the company that's like trying to be different from like what the culture really is. Like if you say like, we want teamwork and like you just look at the, you know, every single Fortune 100 company's website of their culture tenants and they're like patients first, teamwork, um, like support, you know, there's like all these like, like you know that those are just like what they want, um, but not what they're really like. You know, like and then you just like go talk to the CEO and he's kind of like, kind of like a hard driving asshole or something like he should build a company of like, we're all hard driving assholes um and like own it and you probably do really well you know in certain in, in certain in you know per, per domains or whatever um and rent yeah how often do uh how often do do the three of you see the situation that sam mentioned where you have really good culture within a single team but that doesn't extrapolate to the broader organization does that actually happen very often i actually think that and you know one of the first things that i would look at especially if you're trying to go into ml and you're looking at applying that to biotech is it's very very hard to retrofit ml because you know i mean everybody knows garbage and get garbage out but you know time and time again i think we've seen that it's it's you got to start co-designing the experimental work together with the ml 
and um, look at the teams. Like, what is the team composition? Do you have five biologists that are in that room? And then you have five computational biologists that are in a different room? Or do you have an experimental platform where, for example, in the, what device are we going to buy? Like, do you have computational biologists in that meeting, right? So is the, um, the application of machine learning, is that co-designed from the scratch or retrofitted? And I think retrofitting it is, is very, very hard. It's so hard. In fact, I gave up and, and you know, jumped from McKinsey and started my own company because it's so hard. And I think it goes back to the technophobia that Joe mentioned. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're sort of still stealing, you know, their bread and butter. You, you know, they have sort of this existential anxiety of being replaced by the new generation of tools. And so I think it's super, super important to, uh, you know, join organizations that didn't just retrofit it because it was a nice thing, but where ML is in the design phase and at every decision step, not only for the uh, technological ML platform, but also for the experimental platform. What does that mean for legacy companies? You know, like Eli Lilly or Ellie Lilly, or however it's pronounced, or all these ones that have been around for a while that are the most prolific drug developers in, in the world, right? Like we have all these great biotechs, but like most biotechs do not successfully bring drugs to market. And so there's this tension here where you have all these larger companies that are the ones who are doing the bulk of the work that actually manifests in changes to people's lives. Uh, but they're also the ones who have to retrofit because they have all this gigantic machinery that they've already put together. And so they have to retrofit. And so, you know, Luca and, and Joe, both of you have at least some experience either working with pharma. I guess both of you never worked directly in these pharma companies. But but and I've had other people say that the pharma experience is is really great. But if if, if these larger companies are are being forced to retrofit and they're not able to kind of just build their companies around computation, do they stand a chance? I mean, I'm sure they stand a chance because they're going to buy up other companies or whatever, but, but insofar as being an actual place where you would want to work to hone your skills and, 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 and contribute, um, is, that, is, there, is that a place that's even worth looking at to work? And we see this in each technological transition. Like the, the fact that we have like Genentech is probably more a more recognized name than Merck now. Um, uh, is that you know there was like uh, cloning. You know, there's a whole new genetic set of genetic technology, and they were they were like on it. And the big pharma companies were like, oh, I think we can just still get fine. We'll get along fine doing um, you know screening lots of small molecules against diseases. Um, some of them will just just die off, and I think that. You know, now we'll have like the, you know, the 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 retros and recursions, and there there there's like a new batch of, and you know, maybe in Citro or something. There's a new batch of of new giant pharma companies who will be created, and a couple of the others will drop off because they just couldn't keep up. Well, what, what seems to happen, at least in in tech, um, is that. The function of startups is basically sort of parabiosis. You know, they, they function as young blood that's then brought into the larger companies because that's how most of these companies end. Like very few startups ever become successful standalone companies. The, most of them that succeed get snapped up and they're absorbed into a larger corporate parent that then hopefully, you know, the parabiosis happens and, and the company rejuvenates a little bit. So do you see that? However, the last time I looked around, like the five most valuable companies in the entire world uh, were startups. You know, there's like Apple, um, Microsoft, um, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, you just go down the list, Amazon, like they're all recent startups within the, just the last two or three decades. So um, it, it's a pretty huge effect, I think. Maybe it's slower in bio. But, yeah. you know, like part of, part of like what retro is, at like some fundamental abstract level. Um, and uh, I don't know, may maybe Sam would, would jam on this, but we're kind of an experiment. And can we use a tech-like mentality to do bio? Like, cause, cause it seems like the biotech industry is like probably like the second most screwed up culture ever after academia. Um, so like, is it possible to bring in this sort of mindset of fuck it let's try it let's think iteratively let's like mentally like be conscious of our dbtl loops and that kind of like various sort of like tech like ways of doing stuff will it work in bio i don't know if it does then i think it'll create a, a bunch of brand new huge ginormous you know like fast forward 20 years and like 
what is the list of top 10 pharma companies? And like, oh, wow, those were startups that happened in the 2020s or something, maybe. Yeah. So you're making a bet that there is going to be this shift here where it's going to be the new wave of biotechs that are built around computation and not just retrofitting it. I'm really loving this, but we're going to have to interrupt it because we should let the audience ask some questions at a certain point. So Tara, what are the good questions that people have asked? Yeah, so we have a question for Luca, uh, which is relevant to the to the question of limitations. Um, so Luca, are your mod are are your are your modelings of conformations based on any alpha fold models? If so, have you noticed a trend where poor inputs yield poor outputs? And how do you believe we can circumvent AI or ML reading garbage and assume that it's true? Yeah, uh, uh, this is a great question. And uh, we might get a little bit nerdy or, or too detailed on this here. Our models aren't based on alpha fold because the types of interactions that we're trying to induce, the, the protein dating that we do, um, they're between non-naturally interacting proteins. And so AlphaFold basically uses evolutionary information to fold you know, single chains into, into monomers and, and fold the structures or to uh, create a sort of a multimer or dimers. AlphaFold only works well when you have strong evolutionary conservation. And we know that uh, for sequences where you have uh, what's called, called a, a low uh, MSA depth, so how many sequences there are across different species, the lower that number gets, the more inaccurate it goes. And so the answer is we uh, have our own uh, methods that are not folding based necessarily to uh, basically solve that problem. Multi-species analysis. Cool. Uh, and this this is a question for everybody. Well, I guess um, for Luca and Joe rather. Um, how can you be sure that how can you be sure that AI models are not using batch effects as a fast track to get better metrics? One of the um, well, the primary sort of preventative method is to um, try to try to spread your experimental variables as much as possible across batches. Um, and then we use ML techniques like variational autoencoders um, to average out or to sort of integrate out um, the batch effects and see how much of the biological signal is in there. Um, you can and you can also like spike in positive controls um, so that you can you know verify that you still see your signal even even after you've integrated out um, batch effects. And if you have if you haven't looked at variational autoencoders, it's such incredibly beautiful math. I highly encourage you to look at them. Cool. Tara, let's do one or two more. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, yes. So one question for Sam. Uh, it's related to, to what you said about, um, you know, about not doing a thing for the sake of doing a thing. So don't just like take AI and do like a peanut butter spread. Uh, so Sam, would you, would, do you think that, um, Ingraining AI into, into the organizational framework for efficiency boosts is something that needed to start a long time ago, or that should have started a long time ago. I mean, I think it's one of those things It's like, well, what is the best time to plant a tree 20 years ago? The second best time is today. I mean, I think that is true for, for most things like, like that. So I don't, I don't, I don't think that it's like, you know, the ship has sailed in any, in any, um, way for for something like you know experimenting with innovation like ai or anything else but yeah if you'd done it earlier ago you probably are uh, ahead of everyone else or, or have seen some results of your experimentation that are telling you um, some interesting things about where to invest your time and attention great so i want to jump back into the discussion and there'll be time for more questions later um so i want to talk about robots and lab automation joe and retro are doing some really interesting things there and i think this will also bring us to a really interesting discussion about the shifting role of uh, bench scientists and, and the, the future interplay between the technologists and the scientists and how scientists might have to become more technologisty. Um, and so Joe, I'd, I'd love if you could lead off by, by telling us a bit about your experience with automation at Retro and, and what, you're, what you're building there. Hmm. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, my 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 goal is success on mission, um, not headcount. Um, and so, if we can build machines that do the work of ten wet lab biologists um, without having to hire nine more, um, that's great. Um, also, people don't like pipetting that much, actually. Um, so, um, but the difficult 
part there is that, uh, and I had this problem back when I was um, helping some friends with a startup called Halcyon Molecular, like, God, um, 13 years ago, and um, where I created some bioautomation things and then none of the biologists used them. Um, and it was it was beautiful what I made to me. Um, it was this really nice like command line thing where you, or, you know this like you could just write the script of exactly what you wanted your experiment to do, and and they just looked at it and was like, I don't want to learn that, um, and I know how to buy pet. Um, so what it requires, so there there ends up being like um, you have to develop these heuristics for what you're going to automate. Like a lot of biology is trying brand new things um, and you you read a paper you see if you can replicate it um and it's uh and it's something entering your lab for the first time and you may try to replicate it and it just fails in which case you just like screw it and try a different paper if you're lucky um, um and so you just can't automate that kind of stuff it takes longer to code it than to just go out and just, like and just do it by hand um so you need some heuristics like you know, we, we've already done this 10 times and we expect to do it a hundred more times. Um, that stuff you can automate. Even still, um, it's just like in computational biology, you don't want this wall um, and the, that you're throwing things over between two different teams. Like you need to wade in there. And so you need to have people on your automation team who, who will kind of wade in and actually learn the biology in a particular group, like in a T-cell group or an HSC group um, and like get to know it. Because there's technique in there. There's like how you hold the, the plates and you kind of tip them up to the light and you see like where the pellet is and you pipette. So like it's just biology just doesn't like abstract very well. Um, there's a lot of interaction of like the body with the cells. Um, is, there an op is there a shift in the opposite direction too, where the biologists are having to learn more of the technology side of things in order to work with these robots and embrace the the wet lab technology of the near future? Way slower. Um, so what happens there? Uh, what I what I've seen so far is that if you go in um, from the automation side and actually get something working, they're like, "Huh, that's kind of cool," and then they'll start paying more attention to it and get more, getting more and more interested in it. But it's like, "See it if I believe it," kind of thing from them. Um, so it, it seems like it needs to be led more by adventurous um, and determined automation people. Um, weirdly. For Luca and, and Joe, um, are there specific sections of, of lab biology that you can name in which kind of brute forcing the old fashioned way in the lab has tended to yield better results than automation? Um, you know, everything that has uh, to do with sort of sample handling, handling cells, you know, things that are finicky where you have a lot of underspecified variables is very, very difficult. Other things, um, you know, like robotic synthesis or, you know, just pipetting 10,000, you know, walls with a small amount of aliquot to screen against proteins, that's going to be uh, easier. So basically, it it depends on uh, exactly like Joe said, like how well can you specify the variables that are involved and how well are they even know in advance? Because iteration speed is not faster with the robot, it's slower, right? Because the program actually takes way more time than just trying to pipe at it. And so the the the, the more your variables are pre-specified in the beginning, you know, I think the, the more applicable the robotics and automation becomes. Like the things they're best at are like lots of combinations of soluble things. Um they're just they just kick ass at that. If you want to do like a 1500 different combinations of different small molecule ratios of your like trying different media combinations amazing and humans are terrible at it and they make mistakes and you don't even know which ones have the mistakes in them um but if it's finicky things like they have to go into the centrifuge and then you have to look at them periodically to see how many of them have sunk down and there's three uh, three layers after the centrifuge and you're pipetting out the middle layer like machines are useless sam what are some issues that you see in organizations when new technology is being brought into the organization that requires, uh, especially multiple groups of people to sort of change the way that they're used to working? What are some of the struggles that come up that that make things real messy? Yeah, and I don't know if this is, I mean, the type of technology that I'm generally working with organizations would be more around like communication or knowledge management, those sorts of things. But there's definitely a, um, a sentiment that what we actually what what we have is a tool problem and if we just get the right tool in here everything will be better 
Um, and more usually um, introducing a new tool will often amplify the actual tensions that are um, existing in an organization and will make things worse until we actually try to get at some of that foundational stuff. So introducing a new communication tool doesn't suddenly every, make everybody good at communicating. It just makes everybody who already has bad communication skills more prolific, uh, which is not necessarily going to solve uh, any problems. So whenever we're talking about tool stuff, we're trying to come at it with a much more kind of foundational take on well, what's the actual issue that's going on here? And maybe a tool, a new tool will help, but chances are there's probably something one layer or more deeper that we need to talk about or do something with as well. So that, actually that, that, that makes me wonder, Joe, if, if you've ever like, um, you, you, you decide, okay, we want this, this robot to mix a bunch of transcription factors, whatever. And then uh, everything got fucked up because there was like some problem with the experimental design or some of the parameters were, were kind of messed up and so there wasn't it, it amplified the 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 problems instead of you know actually supporting the work that you're trying to do um and so your question is what um in your experience uh trying to integrate this new technology into into the drug development process um have you seen it basically kind of amplify problems that were going on or has it mostly been just problems I don't know about amplify problems but like I think that when automation fails it tends to fail more spectacularly um you know rather than like humans tend to tend to fail in a kind of organic way like you're doing a 96 ball plate with like two different gradients of concentrations or something and then like a5 is going to be screwed up because you just like you spaced it out and you did the wrong but the rest of the plate's probably fine but like in computation it's like I mean in, in automation it's like well all the entire IPSC plate is just completely gone. There's like nothing there. And it's like, there was just some mistake early on that, that, that got, those can get massively amplified. But as long, you know, as long as you have decent positive and negative controls um, designed into your experiments, then you can usually pick those up pretty easily. But could that theoretically ruin, like be a very expensive and timely mistake? Like, is this something that we need to be thinking about? Mm, I mean, I mean, it, it, part of designing experiments and I, 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 um, I, I was thinking, we, I want, I want people to always be thinking in bets, um, like program leads as they're designing experiments. Um, cause you, you never know what the reason you're doing experiments is you don't know if it's going to work or not. You don't know what the answer is. Um, and then you're betting a certain amount of like human hours and reagent dollars, um, uh, and calendar time against this bet. And it's like this or this and which, um, and like, so it's like constant constant betting and um i want them to some degree like taking taking into account dollars for that um and then where we ended up but i didn't want to slow them down because i have this kind of like anti-bureaucracy philosophy um <clears throat> here um basically i am the only bureaucracy and I, I i i i commit to delaying nothing by more than 24 hours um <clears throat> is that they end up landing at 50K. Like if an experiment's over 50K, I want you to quantify roughly what the costs are so that you know what bet you're making. Um, other than that, just run with it. Um, so like most of the time, you know, like if there's like a huge amount of sequencing or or and, and or 10X reagents in a given experiment, then it can be pretty a pretty spectacular failure. Um, and then like actually hurt. Um, but... But other than that, usually, usually it's not that expensive. <clears throat> it's, it gets expensive if there's like precious human or animal cells from you know that took a, the, the, they're not there are not very many human donors um, or the like the, there's like a very specific number of animals and then you you know sub, did the prep from the, the particular organ and you have these cells and like these cells are not precious and it took like sixty days to get here. Um, you don't want to screw that up. But other than that, you can just like, I think you can do a lot of automation just on like pretty available cells, pretty available reagents and just like, oh, screwed it up, run it again. And what you lost was four calendar days, not like 400K. So then- I'm, I'm curious, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Tara. Tara. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you guys think of, um, to, to what degree can this kind of take bets philosophy be applied to companies that are not so well-funded, let's say, I mean, you know, retro obviously is the one bets. of the- the bets matter even more. I mean, you're still betting. Um, if you know, if you have like a, a two million dollar funding and the you know, your experiments are like 
20 20k um you only get you only get 100 chips when you walk up to the table like how are you going to spend them and there's different uh layers where you can place the bet right betting on biology is always the riskiest because it takes a lot of time to validate it and it takes a lot of time to validate it betting on chemistry is a lot cheaper if you have a target and maybe that target is even available at avushi or a Eurofence, and you can just send your compounds and test it that's a cheap bet and maybe that's interesting biology so especially if you know if, if you're well, well um well less funded then you know take less ambitious bets and, and try to go where you know there's less risk and you can do you know you can order you know compounds from enemy for 100 bucks per compound and maybe you have a brilliant idea you know what that compound is useful for and it's a target uh, that you can uh, you know order from a cro that's a one person show that costs like a thousand bucks for an experiment right so uh you know it really you just gotta be very um uh, very you know intentional where you place the bet calendar time is also one of your bets um because there's rent and food um and health insurance and all that kind of stuff so just just the time that you are operating also eats away at at your at your runway. Right now, my runway is seven and a half years, but um, it's it's going to get shorter as we continue to scale. So, so the next thing I'm interested in getting into is is what are what are because because as technology develops, it now it enables us to to have larger teams uh, with more specialization, and and these teams can be more interdisciplinary, and that really changes the way that people work with each other. Um, and that changes everyone's job, basically. So I know Luca, you, you're, you've you been with, with Vaunt, you guys have a very interdisciplinary team. Um, and so I, I'd love to, to you know, for everyone to hear a bit about how your teams are are structured because they are they are a bit more of the progressive computational first biotech teams. Yep, uh, I think it really depends on sort of, you know, what is, what's the level of tools and abstractions that you can leverage. So I think, you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen fantastic, fantastic tools come up to work with things. For example, in, you know, 2013, it was a big thing if you could train like a machine learning model to understand how your molecule interacts with a protein. There was companies that raised, you know, tens of millions by doing that because it required a PhD to do it. But now that's like three lines of code in PyTorch, right? And so if you're able to leverage these tools and work with these abstractions that other people have built, um, you, the economics, shift, the skills profile shift, um, the speed at which you can iterate shift. For example, um, with us, but we also see that with the pharma uh, partners that we work with, most teams have now sort of applied ML engineers as part of the project that are responsible for fitting models, simple things, very powerful, uh, leveraging abstractions, like very powerful tools on like specific projects that we work on, right? So um, if you can leverage those abstractions, that's also a great way for people trying to come into the field because like everybody's gonna need to learn those tools anew. And so, uh, you know, if you're like very curious about picking things up, I think you can, you know, contribute very quickly. I think it's very different if you are on the more fundamental side where you develop new tools and abstractions. There, you, I think you need to be a lot more specialized, right? You're not gonna, like the types of like geometric deep learning models that we develop, unless you have like a PhD in CS or math, you're not, it, it's like very esoteric abstract math. And so you're not gonna be able to contribute towards these like tools that we're building. Um, so I, I think there's both a specialization in some parts, uh, you know, when you work on these abstractions, but also the opposite happening where we have a lot more hybrid profiles that know the biology and know the chemistry that um, don't design stupid experiments or apply ML to like, um, you know, ID, uh, to, to spaces where it doesn't make sense. We have a question from the from the audience that's relevant here. Um, are there are there any unique uh, ML issues or software issues um, that are specific to aging startups? Yes. Um... There's the there's there there's this whole world of clocks in in aging, um, which are based on the hypothesis that there's some universal things about aging that are that are different from just something specific to a particular cell function or a particular disease, um, and so then um, there there's the pretty rich a like thick soup of literature um, and just a lot of work to be done. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it very cell type specific on trying to build clocks. And uh, if you don't know what a clock is, it's basically an ML um, thing that you train usually initially based on chronological age. Um, uh, and then you use it as a predictor of biological age. 
later. So if you do a transfer transformation on some cellular system and um, you're getting a lower predicted age um, than when you started, then you're probably rejuvenating those cells in some way, depending on how much you can believe your clock. Um, so the realm of clocks is a huge amount of work that we do here. And um, you can build them on any kind of data that changes over, over you know, chronological time, for instance. Um, you have physical characteristics, gene expression, chromatin accessibility, um, methylation state, um, you know, on and on and on. And then the question is, how good a clock can you build out of them? And what modalities work for those clocks? And what kinds of variants are there in the underlying um, you know, mo molecular things that end up with as data? Um, and what kind of clocks work for that? Um, and it's kind of surprising, some of the things that do and don't work. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the first one that comes to mind for me. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, one thing I'm curious about is uh, in this shifting, more tech-enabled, computational-driven uh, biotech teams, um, I think the the concept of technical debt kind of shifts a bit, wherein in bio, you're like, a lot of folks are used to building really quick and dirty and shitty programs because you're only going to use them once, twice, whatever. And so if these systems kept running, then that would be problematic. Uh, but now that that software tools are a lot better, we're better equipped to like build internal computational platforms. And so I'm wondering if what you're seeing the the shift here as. And Joe is nodding very agreeably. Uh, I don't want to just hog all the talking. Blah, 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 so if people have to. Do it. Luca will jump in if he wants to. Sam will. I'll tell you to shut up. It'll it'll work okay. out. Um, all of academia academic computational biology is kind of like technical debt in and of itself already. Um, the software is usually shitty. It usually got them like just to their like cell biotech paper or whatever and that and then that's it and, and barely. Um, so then trying to use it in industrial context where you want data provenance, repeatability, um, uh, uh, like a, a, a kind of a little more explicitly understanding like what does this really mean? Um, uh, there's some mystery code that generated some mystery numbers, but do we believe it? Um, all that inc involves a ton of hardening. Um, so well, I think we we really had two phases. One where we were just like applying a bunch of stuff, you know, a bunch of stuff out of Leroy's lab, Caltech or whatever, just like a um, bunch of cool tools, like trying this and, and seeing a lot of interesting signals. And at a certain point, we pulled back and did a classic tech company tech debt payback phase and we created this internal package called sc tools um, that's really good now um, it might be it's probably one of the top three best um like like computational biology suites now we kind of started with alex wolf's um stuff um and and um and but largely mostly started over um and so we built like this and you know it's like in, an internal oasis of paradise here of like all the all the data ends up in these like perfectly structured a datas um and datas um uh, all all of the code will execute uniformly on any of the pretty much any of the data types we're standardized about how we talk about metadata um uh and how did you go about standardizing this because this is a not insignificant project so like how long did this take and what was the kind of process um this is probably also something that sam can probably like probably like six months um part of it was hiring some people some like computational biologists who are just like superb software engineers um like being like like doing sloppy software engineering you just end up with like a, a big sloppy pile of of tools like, and, and some of it was also just like from the very top down saying, I, I want data provenance. I want repeatability. I want transparency of the, I want to be able to look at any given like output and be able to click back all the way through. I want to be able to read the Jupyter notebooks. So like some of it is just saying like, I want standard, I'm setting standards now and I'm trying not to be bureaucratic and have them be like bullshit standards that just slow people down. Um, they, they, they should really matter, but some of it wasn't that hard. Now, just every time we have like a set of Google slides with a bunch of data, um, 
there's a link on the slide of saying, here's my Jupyter notebook. And you can just click to it. And it's just, it just takes you to the GitHub. It's not that hard to do, um, but it's just like suddenly everything, everything's available now. You can go back, you just read their Python, you can see the notebook. Um, it references the version in our SE tools of the particular um, you know, method that they called to get there. You can always like backtrack to that version, rerun the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so setting standards. Uh, what, what about you? Do, do, does this echo with kind of what you guys are doing as well? Yeah, I mean, I already said that I think, you know, good tools are the single most the biggest force multiplier that is, you know, there's the famous in the uh, science progresses with new techniques, new discoveries and new ideas, probably in that order. And I, you know, I would interpret like new techniques broader as in, in new tools. And I think what, you know, like I said, you know, now you can have teams where someone spends 25% of their time doing like training machine learning models because it's five lines of code now. So I think the force multiplier that tools have is incredible. What you need though is leadership. And I guess it's, it's great that Joe, that you really care about this. You need leadership that cares about it because if you have the classical science leadership, it's just like, you wanna spend how many weeks to rewrite the thing that we already know how to run? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I will say there is also the opposite. And we've seen that, you know, uh, you know with DeepMind and some of those tech companies coming into, you know, um, biotech, you've seen a, a lot of interest from software people to move into field. And you also saw the other extreme where people are too um, focused on, okay, this is big tech style software and are just not getting shit done anymore. So I, I think there's also a healthy balance between exploitation and exploration here. So you can spend all your day doing, you know, pull request reviews and doing like, uh, like fighting over linting errors and, oh yeah, I, I really think, you know, this should be um, like a, a double quotation marks or a single quotation marks and not getting anything done. So I think it's super important. And that's, I guess, going back to the hybrid profiles. One of the key things that we hired in the beginning, which was very important for us is computational biologists with, with really strong software background. So they've written professional software for a lot of years because these people can make the trade-offs. They can say, I know that I can make the analysis in 20 minutes now and I can fix it next week to be uh, redeployable, but I can get to an answer. And so I think uh, finding that balance is actually super important. Yeah, and this, this is something I guess that a lot of folks in academia need to perhaps think about in that thriving and, and operating under the incentives that you're under um, in many cases will likely demand of you that you build quick and dirty software. Um, and that is very much the, the incentives that you're being offered. And if you want to work in biotech, then that may not serve you well. And so it might be worth thinking about how you want to approach that and whether you want to, to be embracing that traditional technical debt thing or, or not. Now, Sam, I have a question for you, which is why is it so hard for these organizations to, to make the switch and to build these kinds of tools? Why is it that these companies starting out have such an easier time doing that when, when all it is is just listing out requirements, making standard, creating standards, and, and, and building out the tools? Yeah, so and anytime we we're having a conversation about technical debt, um, I, I like to bring up the concept of organizational debt uh, as well, um, which is basically the accrual of policies and rules and processes uh, over time that may have been instantiated for a good reason at that time, but for most organizations, there's no regular practice for re reviewing those and removing them over time. So they just build on top of each other over and over and over, basically forever. And that is where that bureaucracy kind of ends up coming from. So I think being able, like starting to, to look around your organization and sense where there is organizational debt, where there are meetings or processes or anything else that I said that just exist because we're not really sure why because like we've always done it this way is um that stuff is often ripe for re removing and um uh and and they can free up a lot of the, the time and space that you need to do um work like actually removing technical debt and, and things like that yeah so now i think we have 10 minutes roughly so now i guess let's end with some audience questions i really would love to keep talking for another hour or so but uh, everyone's time is precious. Um, and so Tara, Tara, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just yes. pronounced her name properly. I've been mispronouncing it for the year and change that I've known her. I'm still adjusting. So that's why you hear the Tara Tara thing. So Tara, go ahead. Yeah, just think star. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've gotten a lot of interesting questions. I'm going to aim for three and two of them will be technical. One will be sort of more career related. So let's keep that in mind. Let's try to answer three questions in the next eight minutes. Okay, so the first one is, um, what are some of the concrete bottlenecks that 
um, that you guys are struggling with right now that you would need automation help with. So let's make this fun and let's have one, one bottleneck from each person, uh, but try to keep it short. So just like name your bottleneck that you would like automation help with. Um, someone who can bridge um, biology and, and um, technology. I think they meant like a wet lab, but like a bottleneck of like in the experimental process uh, to automate. Organizational design perspective. Um, everything. That was super short. Love it. Luca. Um, getting cells and the biological models, actually, you know, getting licensing uh, of uh, cell types, you know, obtaining these kind of things takes can take forever, many, many weeks. And synthesis, synthesizing molecules is very, very slow. You have a thousand ideas and you can test one because a poor chemist needs to spend half a year trying to synthesize a single molecule. And it might not work. Next question. Oh, wait, Sam, did you have anything? I, I mean, it would not relevant for this crew probably. So you can skip me. Okay. All right, next question. Um, so in, in science today, there's sort of a trend towards um, curating data in like big consortiums. So the data being like publicly shared, um, it helps to benchmark methods and so on. So things like the human cell atlas and code, um, GTEx in biology or um, MNIST in machine learning. Um, so do you think, do you, but do you think there's a lack of public data sets in the aging field? And yeah. if so, what data would you like to see? Uh, I mean, like one of the best things that we've had in the aging for a while is, is TMS, like the tabula Maricenis project, uh, which is just really tiny. Uh, and, and to some of the um, points uh, somebody was making before Amos or Luca, um, the like what got you to the data in the first place is also, you have to deeply understand that because you can just look at the data and say, oh, this is real data because it's on the screen now and it's a, it's a UMAP, but like everything before then could totally screw it up such that the data is meaningless anyway. And like one of the things about TMS is that they did it, that they did basically, in, in case you're not familiar with it, they took old animals and <clears throat> old animals and young animals um, and they just removed a bunch of their organs and, and extracted cells from the tissues and ran single cell RNA-seq and other omics on them. Um, and uh, like for some of the preps were just like kind of sus, like, you know, like you're separating out like hepatocytes from other liver cells and you'd have like five hepatocytes or just like, like they just didn't work. So like, just, it's just a tiny amount of data. Um, so I think specifically for aging, we need a lot, we need a lot more data. And like, we have probably the best data set in biology. Or one of the, one of them, at least in like high dimensional computational biology right now is the census from CZI, um, Chan Zuckerberg initiative, um, just put a ton of work going out, out into all the public data sets they could find it and brought them into one nice, perfectly rows and columns um, um, structure um, that is roughly about 44 million cells right now. Um, but it doesn't have any perturbation data in it and pretty much. Um, um, and it's not, you know, it's not that strong of an aging of an aging signal. Like you want it coupled with like age-related phenotypes rather than just age. Um, but you can train some clocks off of it. It's pretty good, but just, we need more. So more perturbation data. Perturbation well. in, in particular, yeah. Luca, what, what about you? What do you want to say? Yeah, so there, there's a sort of two, two steps to finding a drug. Number one is defining your target. And number two is sort of picking your arrow. Uh, we work, I guess Joe works a, a lot more also on sort of defining a target, understanding aging biology. We work a lot on sort of defining the arrow and being able to design these arrows a lot more high throughput. And there, the rate limiting step is always, can you model physics to understand things? Because once you can, you have models that generalize really well. And arguably one of the biggest AI breakthroughs that happened in biotech, AlphaFold, basically you know, piggybacked on a fantastic resource, the PDB, having an extremely diverse set of uh, proteins, very nicely curated and ready for machine learning. And right now we, you know, if you look at the equivalent data sets for designing, for example, novel small molecule intervention or induced proximity intervention, that data is extremely sparse and extremely um, biased because the way that it's collected is unlike many of the protein structures, which you know came out of fundamental biology, a lot of small molecule protein structures, they were based on uh, design um, projects from within Big Pharma or finding these therapeutics. And so you have an extremely strong bias where you have extremely good information on the existing therapeutics, but where you actually wanna go, which is novel biology, you have 
basically no data. And these, uh, you know, creating these sort of structures, you know, it's it's a you know a million bucks a pop with classical uh, crystallography. So I think we're going to see uh, some exciting stuff there with cryoM, and we work a lot with structural proteomics to basically be able to scale that up, uh, you know, two to three orders of magnitude cheaper. Um, but yeah, good high quality structured data for for interventions. Lovely. All right, we probably have time for one more question. Let's make it a good yes. one. So well, this this question I got uh, many variations of, so I think I'm going to ask it. Uh, basically, um, actually, I'm going to read somebody's question who worded it well. Uh, Joe said that his requirement for paying someone more than minimum wage is that they already have a deep understanding of biology, and this will take months of 16-hour days to develop. Mm -hmm. That makes it sound like a data scientist without bio biology experience is out of luck, unless they have the financial resources to work for free or go back to school. Is that true? Um, I mean, it depends on how much television you watch. Uh, like, there's a lot of there's a lot of time in a day, and if you're like deeply passionate about something, for me, it's basically zero. Uh, there's there's a if you're deeply passionate about something, you can work a day job and spend eight more hours learning about biology. Um, like, if you want it, you can do it. And how much? How much of that? How, how much knowledge should they have before you would consider? Hiring such a how do you quantify invest? knowledge? Um, Seven. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, you you know it when you feel it, I guess. Um, but like, feel like I, I, th I think you, you can quantify in certain ways. Like one, like how how, how close to the state of the art are you getting in the papers that you can read? Can you read a paper that came out, uh, you know, today and and say, oh, you understand why this is different from like something that was discussed in a paper from two years ago, um, then you're getting there. So yeah, I, I want to I want to ask a, a very specific question, which is what do you feel, Luca, Joe, what do you feel are the best ways to learn biology really quickly? Because um, some people are pro textbook, some people are pro papers, some people are pro start up a project and just learn that way. What what are your what are your respective opinions on that? Luca, why don't you go first? I, I think you're going to need to read a textbook and there's no way around it. And these are large textbooks and it's going to take, you know, a lot of work to get through. But I completely agree with Joe that, you know, you need to just, you know, you need to come with the terms that, you know, I'm going to spend a year just trying to understand the science here. And there's uh, in bio, there's a lot of um, fantastic textbooks, you know, um, Peterson, uh, uh, then um, Albert's Molecular Biology, uh, Jane Ways, I mean, all, there's fantastic books, and I've actually reread read them since my undergrad multiple times because they're so good. So textbooks are fantastic, like don't discount that. And then obviously you're going to need to pick up the tacit knowledge, but yeah, read, the textbooks are great. <laughs> I spend a lot of time talking with ChatGPT about biology these days, weirdly. Um, I mean, it just sounds like so wrong, um, but like it's creepily correct about many things. Um, and, but, but I agree, you need this, you need this kind of foundation. And some people do have different learning styles. So some people are more top down and some people are more bottom up. Like some people want like can motivate everything from a particular project. Someone says, I want you to help me understand what this data set means and read this paper. Um, and and um, once you understand it, we'll be ready to have a conversation. Um, you read the paper and it's like all, Greek to you, um, then, then you have work to do and just keep going um, and work your way. That's sort of a bottom-up approach. Like, okay, um, and it's largely how I've learned most, most, most of what I know. Um, I, just, I don't understand this stuff. So then I have to go learn some other thing. And you're like, I just, I don't understand that either. And you just keep branching out into this infinite fractal that eventually comes back and then you're ready. So um, then you, you, you would say don't even try to be too strategic about what you're learning just start learning some biology stuff and it's going to go down all these crazy paths and then you'll 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 learn. if my life path like i'm interested in this i'm going to do stuff i'm interested in only stuff i'm interested in and just, just decide what you're interested in. i'm i'm into aging and i want to do like computational biology of aging just go find like maybe some company that's doing computational biology of aging it's like just ask them like what are the top three papers that that like bear on the kinds of things that you guys are thinking about at the company they'll usually just tell you because it's not even that confidential because it's public information to see what it takes for you to understand them it might take you six months of like shit i don't understand anything they're saying in here yeah. and then you can, you can also like if you're if you're that kind of a learner you can start testing your knowledge like this this sounds crazy but you can just start like 
texting people or like sending emails to some of the authors on the papers. Say, I was wondering what you meant by this, or did you try this other thing? They'll talk to you. Like these, these academics, like they're in incredibly specialized areas and there's like five people who actually understand what they're doing. When there's a new person that pops up that's curious about that thing, they love talking about it. That's the foundation of, of, of biology, right? Is questions. So I know people who've gotten job offers just from emailing a professor or, or some PI and, and after reading the paper, not all of them will respond, but a lot of them will. And another, this is like, we have to go, but one, one additional thing, people do not do this. I tell people to do this. And, and a lot of leaders have told me this is good, but map, map out some kind of learning journey for yourself and some kind of path from how you're going to get from where you are now to where you want to be. And then reach out to people for feedback, reach out to people who have the jobs you want, or people who are a couple levels higher, reach out to a bunch of people for feedback. You're giving them something tangible that they can respond to. It doesn't require them to schedule a meeting with you or talk to you. So people who are time poor can like respond to it while they're on the toilet or between meetings or whatever. And so like, uh, yeah. I, I also agree with, with Luca on so, sometimes like immunology, I just want, I wanted to learn it and I wanted to learn it fast. And it's really thick interweb web of stuff. And so I, I picked up a Boston Lickman, which is the, the, the graduate text they use at UCSF. Um, and I just read that cover to cover and it was like an, an, an adventure novel. It's like, it was an, it's an incredible data set. And that was so fun that I, I ended up reading it again many years later because just, just it's like some of the things like, we don't know. There was like 20 to 50 things I bookmarked in the first edition where they just ended up with like, and nobody knows. And a bunch of those were then, so that works too. And you can do both basically. Yeah. And I, you know, whenever you start a topic, you're just like, oh, I'm never going to use this. And I've literally never had a situation where I read a textbook and, uh, you know, not within the next three months, I found like a situation Ooh. where it's that sounds like it, for me, but like taking early on Andrew Ng's machine learning course on Coursera. It's like, I was probably getting, you know, this is back in like, I don't know, 2000, 20, 2012 or something. This is getting to be kind of an interesting field or whatever. Um, I should probably learn a little bit about it. And then like every single thing I learned and that course, I just constantly apply. Um, so like some of those things work really, really well. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, everyone's got to go now. Thanks a lot. For, for those who are interested in organizational design and these kinds of things, check out uh, Sam's firm, theready.com. They've got all kinds of cool resources and some videos and stuff. Uh, they're really one of the very, very few firms that think about things in an actual right way, and they actually get it. So check out theready.com. They're awesome. Thanks a lot, Joe and Luca and Tara. Um, Joe, obviously, Retro Luca is with Vont AI. Check them out. Thanks you all for coming. Uh, I enjoyed this a lot, and I'm sure. Thanks, our oh. Farewell. Really, really nicely structured. Thank you. Thanks all for the questions. Ciao. Thanks, everybody.